so we should begin i think yeah. so first of all um good afternoon everybody and welcome to this uh gecko meeting which is of course hosted by the gastro foundation in association with project echo university of new mexico the meetings of course held on a weekly basis and this is in fact our fourth um ibd echo the um, registrations that we have today, 103 individuals from 10 different countries. And before I introduce our speaker, Dave, I would just encourage you to ask questions and please post them on the chat. Okay, so quickly, Dave probably doesn't need much introduction, especially to South Africans, but he's essentially a gastroenterology practicing, a gastroenterologist practicing at Vincent Pilotti Hospital here in Cape Town. And Dave has a very large IBD practice and he really is an expert in the field. And it's his passion for IBD that led him to start um, uh, IBD Africa some years ago. The idea being to support IBD education, to support uh, IBD research, and of course, um, patient advocacy. So Dave's going to chat to us this afternoon a little bit about IBD Africa itself and then run through a case with, with us. So welcome Dave and thank you very much. Thanks Jill, thanks very much for that um, uh, introduction and, and thank you for the to the Gastro Foundation and ECHO for inviting me to uh, present uh, today's uh, meeting. I'm just going to start my slideshow. Right, is that, does everyone see that? Is that all good? It's not in presentation mode. Uh, right. Perfect. Okay. Right, so um, I've got um, two talks today. The first is about um, a nonprofit company called IBD Africa, which um, we established in 2019. And then the second half will be uh, uh, an IBD case presentation. All right, so what is IBD Africa? So IBD Africa is a nonprofit organization. We officially launched in August, 2019, and we have an, a mandate, and that mandate is to improve IBD care in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we achieve that through um, three uh, uh, legs or arms to the, to the project. The first is research, second education, and third is advocacy. And we aim to be a home to all things IBD in, in our region. So just a brief introduction, what is inflammatory bowel disease? Most of us are aware that it consists of two conditions, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And what is the cause of this um, condition? Well, we know there, there are four elements to, to IBD. We know that there's a wide range of genetic um, susceptibility um, uh, signals. We know that um, IBD is critical uh, to the uh, bowel microflora and some of the antigens that we find in the gut. It's related to an aberrant, aberrant immune response. And there are a number of well-described environmental triggers. And in, if we had to summarize that, it would be that IBD could be related to an inappropriate activation of the intestinal mucosal immune system in response to commensal bacteria in a genetically susceptible individual exposed to environmental triggers. And as those of you who perform endoscopy on a regular basis will know that um, the gut has um, sort of normal mucosal pattern and features as demonstrated by these slides. But when a patient has IBD, whether it's Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, there's a significant impact um, on the integrity of, of the, of the uh, gut, and this leads to um, all the symptoms and, and significant impairments in quality of life. We must also remember that IBD is characterized by a number of extra intestinal manifestations, and this is a long list of, of, of extra intestinal manifestations we encounter. And these are just some of the examples of the skin, um, vasculature, eyes, mouth, and spine manifestations of, of IBD. All right, so why the need for IBD Africa? Why do we need this organization? Well, we believe that there are a lot more people living with IBD in Sub-Saharan Africa, whether they were recognized or not, is debatable. I think patients in Africa have unique challenges. We have an overwhelming burden of infectious diseases, which complicates the diagnosis and treatment of IBD, very different to patients um, from more developed countries. And there's definitely a lack of diagnostic resources. We also have limited access to treatment in many of the countries on the subcontinent. Um, there's very poor understanding of IBD by people who control healthcare legislation and people who fund healthcare. 
patient education is very limited and there's almost non-existent patient advocacy. So how do we achieve our mandate? Well, we achieve it in three ways, research, education and advocacy. And I'm gonna take you through those three elements of our organization. All right, so what about research? So we would like to understand IBD in the African context. We are faced with a unique um, um, expression of IBD in, in the continent, and we have to understand the disease in our context and not rely on research from um, developed countries, which might not be appropriate for us. So we know that IBD um, was a, a sort of a rare disease prior to the Industrial Revolution with sporadic cases described. But during the progression of the 20th century, we saw an increase in IBD in developed countries, and we found that IBD was very much bound by ethnicity and geography. But since the beginning of the 21st century, we've come to recognize that IBD is a global disease, and we're seeing an exponential increase in cases of IBD from many of the developing countries around the world. Um, we know that in, in um, countries that didn't see much IBD, they tend to see ulcerative colitis first, uh, and this precedes the onset of Crohn's disease in their populations by about 10 years. Now, we have to understand where we are in terms of global epidemiology. Well, the first thing is we're seeing a rising incidence of IBD, and this is, reflect, this is caused by two things. Number one, there's a true rise in incidence due to um, a number of environmental factors, and then there's an unmasking causing a rise in incidence, and this is due to better diagnostics. And both these contribute to an increased incidence um, uh, in the population and with that a cumulative increase in prevalence. And the reason for that is that most people live their lives with IBD. Very few people die from IBD. So as the incidence increases, so the prevalence tends to accumulate. And we believe that in Africa, and we suspect that we're in the phase of acceleration incidence and um, compounding prevalence. And we should anticipate to see vast numbers of patients increasing over the next sort of 30 to 40 years. Whether they'll all be diagnosed, treated adequately, and receive the best care, um, that remains debatable. If we look at data from Cape Town, where we've been running our registry for um, several years, and we have data going back to the 1950s and 60s, we can see that there's been an in exponential increase in the number of new cases that we see every year. And if we go back and compare this to some studies done in the 80s and late 70s, we can see that you know, the, the numbers have changed dramatically and we were seeing IBD in a very limited segment of our population, um, which we no longer um, see anymore. And we in fact are seeing IBD across all ethnicities in South Africa. If one looks at um, time to diagnosis, how long does it take uh, a patient from the first onset of symptoms to diagnosis, on average, it would take a Crohn's patient about two and a half years and an ulcerative colitis patient a year from the onset of first symptom to diagnosis. And that seems to compare favorably to data from around the world. I think one of the biggest challenges for our patients in Africa is distinguishing um, intestinal TB from inflammatory bowel disease. And certainly at the bedside, one cannot distinguish TB from IBD. Um, IBD has characteristic features such as perianal disease and extra intestinal manifestations, but these can also be a feature of TB. Um, routine laboratory tests are abnormal in both conditions and are not helpful in distinguishing one from the other. Things like thrombosis are common in both conditions. And a number of the extra intestinal features can be mimicked by direct TB involvement of joints and skin and other organs or by immune-mediated phenomenon, which are common in both TB and in IBD. And interestingly, a chest X-ray or uh, uh, imaging of the chest is often normal in patients with intestinal TB. So that doesn't always help you distinguishing uh, intestinal TB from IBD. And obviously the consequences of getting the diagnosis incorrect are, are substantial. Um, if one immunosuppresses a patient with intestinal TB, that can be disastrous. And similarly, if one treats a Crohn's patient with anti-TB therapy, um, one's going to just delay um, uh, remission. Another challenge we have is looking after children with IBD. And if we look at the data from IBD Africa, we can see that a significant number of patients are diagnosed beyond, uh, beyond, before the age of 18. And who looks after these patients? Pediatric um, 
resources or gastroenterology resources are extremely limited. In South Africa, we have one pediatric gastroenterologist per 2.8 million people. And one wonders what the ratio is north of here in, in, in other sub-Saharan uh, African countries. And certainly we find that a lot of children find themselves in a no man's land where gastroenterologists are uncomfortable looking after children and pediatricians are uncomfortable looking after IBD. And many of these children find themselves um, out of care. What about IBD in the rest of Africa? Well, you know, we don't really have very good data. Um, these are three reviews that have recently been published on um, inflammatory bowel disease in, in, in Africa and sub-Saharan Africa. And what we've seen is that there are mostly case reports and there's a cumulative number of about 210 cases reported from sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa. The only good incidence and prevalence studies are from South Africa and Algeria. And there's a whole range of theories and hypotheses regarding genetics, hygiene, diet, and microbiome, which may be unique to Africa in terms of IBD. And this is really a huge untapped source of research um, and may offer the key to many of the questions that we have in terms of IBD um, etiology. So how many patients in Africa um, have IBD and go undiagnosed? And that's very difficult to answer because we just don't have the data. We know that many infectious diseases can mimic IBD and uh, there's really no data to, to, to tell us how many patients are on this. But maybe this interesting study from uh, Malawi um, may give us some clue as to what happens in, in rural areas where in this study, patients, uh, the prevalence of depression amongst uh, uh, healthcare, um, by a primary healthcare clinic. These were assessments of patients for depression um, uh, in a primary healthcare clinic. And it was found that almost 20% of patients with depression were incorrectly treated for malaria. Just shows you how the overwhelming infectious disease burden can obscure so many other diseases in, in Africa. One of the focus of IBD Africa is to highlight um, doctors doing outstanding work in managing IBD in, in the continent. And, and we've done some interviews and questionnaires, which you can view on our website, just highlighting some of our colleagues doing um, amazing work in managing IBD under difficult circumstances. Right, the next component of IBD Africa is education. And I'm gonna focus this part of the talk on health literacy. So health literacy is defined as the capacity to obtain, communicate, process, and understand health information and services in order to make appropriate health decisions. And this is very important in IBD where we have complex treatment regimes. We often have um, options for shared decision-making and better self-care. And all this hinges on um, building health literacy. So what happens when there's poor health literacy? Often their medication errors, adherence to medication is poor, use of preventative services is not great. Patients generally tend to have more emergency room visits, have longer hospital stays and increased readmissions. And in fact, it's been shown that there's a higher mortality associated with poor health literacy. How does this manifest in IBD? What we would see if patients are unaware of the extent of their disease, they're unable to give a sequential medical history, if they've had surgery, they cannot recall what operation was performed or what part of the bowel was removed, often unable to name medications, poor disease monitoring. My experience is there's often excessive use of steroids, and there have been studies to show increased depression amongst patients with poor health literacy. And it really is rewarding for me when we see patients who've been through our program and I happen to cross paths with them, and they come to me, and this is the type of conversation we would have or the patient would have with me. I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease at 18. I have Crohn's of the ileum. I've been on azathioprine 200 milligrams for five years. My last white cell count was 5.2. My last stool count protection was 20 micrograms. And I saw a dermatologist to look for azathioprine related skin issues eight months ago. And I really feel that we've done our job when I encounter patients who can have this conversation with me. Um, and it really makes managing these patients just that much easier and outcomes so much better. So we recognized that there were huge gaps in IBD health literacy with the onset of the COVID-19 epidemic. We were, through some of our forums, we were realizing that patients had 
huge misunderstandings when it came to their medication. And a typical example would have been patients who are on 5-ASA medications, such as um, salazapyrine or mesalamine, and they thought these were immune suppressing drugs and decided to stop these medications with onset of COVID-19. And that really highlights just very poor health literacy in terms of you know, understanding their medication. And then what we also recognized is that we used to run formal patient meetings, but these were really had limited reach. We would gather at most 100 to 200 patients a meeting once a year, and uh, our reach was, 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 was limited. So what we did with the onset of COVID-19, we moved on to an um, electronic or Zoom format, where we were able to now have meetings involving all patients in South Africa and possibly outside of South Africa. And as I say to, to my colleagues, we were able to bring the world of IBD into the living room of these patients. And the effect that this has had on patient literacy and education has been absolutely phenomenal. We've run a series of meetings on various aspects of COVID-19. We then started running meetings on um, the use of the, uh, the, the arrival of new biologics in South Africa. And uh, the, the response has been phenomenal and it's been growing from strength to strength. So just to give you an example, our last meeting was um, last month. And this was a meeting on IBD, COVID-19 and vaccinations. And who would have thought we would have had people of the caliber of James Lindsay speaking directly to South African IBD patients. And what we heard from James, James and his um, nursing sister, Ana Ibarra, who, who leads his um, nursing service, IBD nursing service on their experience of rolling out COVID-19 vaccinations um, in the UK. And it really was a most outstanding meeting for us embarking on a whole vaccination program in South Africa. We also had a local infectious diseases expert and a Corinne Davidson, one of our IBD Africa um, committee members uh, participating as well. She's an IBD nurse. And what I would like to just highlight is the reach that this had, sorry. Um, I'm just gonna move my thing. Sorry, I'll just get this out of the way. Right, sorry. So we were able to reach more than 8,000 people through this, this last meeting and had almost 2,000 engagements. And it just is greater than our wildest sort of dreams that we would have so many patients engaged in, in, in um, discussions around IBD in this country compared to our formal meetings that we had in the past. All right, what about advocacy? So this has been a very exciting journey for us. So what does advocacy mean? Well, it's from the Latin advocatio, which means to summon or call to one's aid. And the idea of advocacy is to have patients, is, is to have advocates speaking on behalf of those patients who voices, whose voices aren't heard. And South Africa has a good history in terms of patient advocacy. One only needs to look at the Treatment Action Campaign, which was a, uh, an organization that really got the ARV treatment rollout in this country started through a very vigorous and um, comprehensive ad advocacy, patient advocacy program. Um, and, and really, I think that, that has really been the, set the benchmark um, for patient advocacy in South Africa. So where is, where is there a role for patient advocacy? I'm just gonna give you two examples. This is um, South African Council for Medical Schemes. This is a government gazetted guideline for the treatment of Crohn's disease. Now, anyone with, with, with the slightest knowledge uh, of IBD will realize that this extremely simplified approach to Crohn's disease is obsolete and of no value to, to, to anyone. And, and this is what the authorities in South Africa are using as a benchmark on which to adjudicate treatment decisions. This is completely inadequate. <clears throat> One of the other challenges, <clears throat> excuse me, is access to treatment. And this graph just shows us how few patients have access to biological drugs in South Africa. The vast majority of people in the state sector don't have access, and only the very wealthy who can afford the top medical aid plans um, can afford biologicals. So there's a huge in um, inequality in terms of access to biological medications. And despite that, the number of drugs being sold in the country has been increasing every year, but the pool of users is probably remaining the same or getting smaller. So these I've highlighted two advocacy issues that are desperately needed, uh, need to be addressed. 
So our advocacy journey started um, last year on World RBD Day, where we hosted a meeting called um, Power Through Shared Stories. And the aim of this meeting was to start patient advocacy with the patient narrative. And there's a lot of research and uh, work done on patient narratives and how they um, can lead to greater patient advocacy. And we were very fortunate to cross paths with uh, Lauren Pretorius, who works for the um, Campaigning for Cancer organization. And she's a formidable patient activist and, and advocate. And um, we, we had further discussions with her and we started our own patient advocacy training, which was uh, launched um, this month. So what we've done is we've chosen 12 patients who were selected um, through our Ivory Africa platform. And these, this was open to participants in both the private and public sector and from all areas of the country. And these first 12 participants have started their training and they underwent a full day workshop on advocacy fundamentals. And they've started with, if you could change anything, what would it be? And this group of, of advocates have decided to tackle government legislation on IBD treatment. Um, and their mandate and their task is to try and get alignment with the recently published South African Gastroenterology Society guidelines that um, were published last year. And they will use both print media, social media, patient, patient mobilization to try and <coughs> um, <coughs> motivate and um, um, campaign to have the guidelines updated. And we are joining um, the Patient User Network, which is a group of um, patients and disease organizations. Uh, these are generally chronic diseases that are going to um, um, approach government to improve and revise and um, make more equitable chronic disease care. So we are gonna join this network and as a group are going to be um, challenging government to, to improve the care of chronic diseases, of which IBD will be one. And we're very grateful to Takeda for, for sponsoring this, this, this group of, of, of patients. And we would very much like to have in our next cohort, patients from other parts of the continent training in patient advocacy and, and, and how to, to, to make your voice heard. So I think, you know, in this short presentation, I think we've had an impact on the lives of patients with IBD, particularly in South Africa, We're starting to venture into other parts of Africa through our um, three-prong approach of research, um, education, and advocacy. Thanks. Thank you, David, uh, for that wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I've always said it that uh, you know, when we started this many years ago, uh, it was such a wonderful you know, initiative. And I remember that the initial plan at the time was to get um, the patients uh, with IBD on the registry to get a sense of who the patients are and how they're presenting, uh, et cetera. But clearly over time, this has evolved into a very sophisticated uh, registry that collects data, but also achieves, you know, other um, aspects uh, of, of patient management, uh, including advocacy, which you have shown so well. Uh, so congratulations on this. Um, I remember the days when you used to collect data, just taking stickers uh, and sort of painstakingly uh, doing that uh, one by one. Um, I have a questions of my own, but I see uh, Ishmael Mula has posted a question. He says, how do we as a fraternity improve biologic access in the private and public sector to ensure equity and better health outcomes? Right, well, I mean, that's, that's a tough question. I think, um, I think we all have a role to play in that. Um, I think when we treat patients with biological drugs, we, there's a, a partnership, whether it's willing or unwilling, between the doctor, the patient, the funder, the industry who set prices, um, and some of the regulating bodies such as SAGES. And I think it's a partnership. And one of the challenges is to try and get everyone to onto the same page um, to make sure that everyone does their part in, in facilitating patients getting onto treatment. So if it's funders, the prices, pricing has to be acceptable. 
um, sorry, from industry pricing of drugs has to be acceptable, from the funders that are willing to pay has to be acceptable, and the benefits of putting patients on treatment has to be made clear. Um, for patients, we ask them to comply with all the requirements needed to get them onto biologics. And as doctors, we have to prescribe them. Um, so all of these things um, need to sort of fall into line in order for patients to, to get onto drug. But the problem is that not the number of patients who deserve to be on treatment is small. And I think that is the challenge that for those who have the, um, the means, getting onto the drug is not a problem. But for the hundreds and possibly thousands of patients who desperately need drug, that is where the challenge lies. And so I'm hoping through our initiative, certainly through our changing of the guidelines and updating guidelines, if we have that in place, then the ability to challenge decisions becomes that much easier because the guidelines now are part of legislation and if you know companies and funders have to now comply with legislation. So I think the starting point is the adoption of the latest guidelines. And, and that really, I think, is an excellent starting point. And it's one that patients have recognized as um, their, their first advocacy goal. I mean, do you think the time is ripe now to use the guidelines and the information that you have on the registry to now engage you know, government, uh, the private funders, you know, other medical doctors to then mobilize um, this cry for access to medication that we know patients require. Well, there always are. data is always, you know, the more data you have, the, the, the stronger your case. So, so the more data we have on the, the demand and the need for, for treatment, the, the greater our case is and the, and the more clout it has when we go into the, into the meetings and into the negotiations. So, you know, I think data and advocacy go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, are there any other comments or questions sir, for David? Yeah, I'd like to, um, if I may, Masheka, just congratulate David on this initiative. And, um, and it complements what Foundation is trying to do through our IBD Gecko sessions, our interest groups, um, and also encourage all our colleagues in Sub-Saharan Africa to embrace this initiative and also share with us their, their cases that they might have problems with. Um, uh, by contacting Karen, and we'd be very happy to allow you to present them on our on, at our Gecko sessions. Two issues: the guidelines that uh, David uh, mentioned are those of Sub-Saharan Africa too, not only South Africa. Mm -hmm. And on, although we are, you know, we're, we're aware that biologics may not be that readily available in Sub-Saharan Africa, at least the guidelines paint and give you an idea of what we should be aiming for. And then finally, one big problem in Sub-Saharan Africa with IBD is the pathology diagnosis. And I'm very glad that uh, Sajan Ojo is with us, um, um, uh, our, our Sub-Saharan pathologist who's been very active in our, in, in, in our uh, GASA and foundation initiatives. And we do plan uh, with gecko pathology to extend uh, the teaching from hepatology um, uh, to luminal GI and particularly presenting the pathology of how to differentiate IBD from tuberculosis. So that's all in the pipeline. And I would encourage you to look out for those sessions on gecko pathology, which would help you. So David, congratulations and really an, an, an admirable uh, endeavor for a very busy and sort of get, sought after gastroenterologist in pri private practice, you're, you're to be congratulated. Well done. Thanks, thanks Chris. David, we do have a bit of time. So before we go to the case, I was wondering, so one of the biggest um, criticisms of uh, patient data registries is uh, patient privacy, you know, the Poppy Act in South Africa, uh, issues of confidentiality, maintaining anonymity, how one shares the data without compromising uh, the patients, etc. So I was just wondering if you might be able to give us a background as how to how you navigated that space uh, of obtaining all of those ethical principles whilst collecting very much needed data for the registry. Um, yeah, and, and, and that overlap between, you know, what is clinical practice uh, versus research versus advocacy as you presented it. Thanks, Nash. I mean, that, that's such a, it's such an important question and one that we grapple with. Um, you know, the, the, the cynical side of me says that, um, you know, people should have to approach an ethics committee to explain why they're not collecting data, um, rather than the other way around. Um, you know, that, that's one side of it. You know, 
we as a continent desperately need data. You know, decisions about our healthcare and the diseases we face and the challenges we face, um, you know, are so dependent on accurate data um, that, that, you know, it, it, it's almost essential in, in everything that we do. So that's on the, on the one hand. But on the other hand, there's this um, vigorous pushback um, from the ethical and uh, protection of personal information side where, you know, this data shouldn't be shared and, 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 and you know, there, there are all barriers to, to sharing personal data. And to find the balance between the two, I think is difficult. Um, you know, where, where does the balance lie? What is in the greater good of, of, of the community versus the rights of the individual? So, I mean, how we've approached is we've had to go to the, to the lawyers. We've had to draft very thorough consent forms which cover all aspects of sharing of healthcare information, of de-identification, um, permission to publish data, depersonalized data, um, permission to, you know, if there's any commercial component to data. So we've got a very detailed consent form which covers all the um, legal requirements in terms of uh, collecting patient data. Um, right. securing of data, the type of servers you, you, you store your data on, are they housed on the continent or in, in South Africa or off the continent? These are all the things that we've gone through over the years to try and make sure that we comply with, with the, the, the sort of best practice. But it's a hindrance. And, and in some respects, I think it's counterproductive. And so others, people may argue with me, but you know, I just think we, we don't have the luxury of not collecting data. Um, Catherine has asked um, how many of the patient groups engaged with IBD Africa might be engaged in digitally uploading the data into the registry? So we have the ability for patients to self-register through our platform. So these are patients who can answer limited questions about their illness um, just so that we can get numbers. Uh, basic demographics, basic disease um, information, and when a patient was diagnosed. Uh, and patients can self-register. And we have, you know, had, you know, many hundreds of patients who over the years have self-registered uh, in that way. So it allows us to populate some of our data field, you know, our data points, um, but it's not going to be the same as the data that we get from, say, practice audits, or, uh, you know, when, when doctors who participate add patients to the registry, but that's fine. I think as long as we can try and capture as many patients as possible, um, the better it is for us to understand this disease in, in, in our country. Yeah, I think I'll allow a final quick comment. Uh, Catherine, if it's okay with you, um, why don't you rather unmute so that you can ask your second question? Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, David. Uh, Hi, Catherine. I to see you all but, uh, all but virtually. So I was just thinking about the really excellent work that's been run out of UCT on the practical approach to care for primary care services to be educated and uh, in terms of diagnosticians in, in, our, in the communities in Africa. Uh, I don't know if you run out of, I think it was, it was originally a, conceived by a chest physician specialist uh, who couldn't work out why so many people with relatively mild asthma ended up on ITU. And so rather than tackling it from the sort of tertiary level care, they started to tackle it by better education and better recognition and treatment of asthma in the community. It's a fantastic model. And I'm just wondering whether a similar, a similar model, a practical uh, approach to care kit for physicians in Africa to help them recognize and, and deliver earlier di diagnosis, which again, need not to be very complicated. It could be the, it just needs to raise awareness of, of that differential diagnosis and therefore a way of then uh, recognizing that diagnosis, which could be patient uplifted by the app uh, into the register. So Catherine, that's such a, that's a very um, interesting question. Um, so I think the differences between asthma and IBD, um, I think for asthma, diagnosis at primary care level is probably a lot easier or finding patients at primary care level. Yeah, diagnosis is, is a lot easier. 
then IBD. You know, we often talk about IBD as the hidden illness. You know, there are a lot of patients, if you see them walking around you know, in the street, you would never know they had IBD. Um, so IBD, I think, is a lot more difficult to diagnose uh, compared to asthma. And, you know, we have such an overwhelming burden of general gastrointestinal problems, whether it's, um, you know, infectious diarrheas, um, IBS, sort of uh, peptic ulcer disease, a lot of things like gastric cancer. We, we have a lot of diseases that obscure IBD. And to, to try and sort of sift them out of the general community and general population is so much more difficult, I think, than asthma, where, you know, everyone sort of recognizes a wheeze or, you know, can take a history which would immediately identify a patient with possible asthma. Whereas GI symptoms tend to be rather vague, um, overwhelmed by a lot of other noise in the background. And, and therefore we, 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 we think it's, it's gonna be it's that much more difficult to, to find these patients in the community. Um, certainly there needs to be more work at primary healthcare level, um, but the challenge remains that it's, it's sometimes a difficult diagnosis to make. And, and, and as we sort of report, it takes almost two and a half years for a patient with Crohn's disease um, to get diagnosed in Cape Town. I, I appreciate your comments. And I'm just wondering though, that as we emerge into the rollout of cheaper and more available of nearside, uh, more nearside patient testing, things like relatively uh, fecal calprotectin rather than an ELISA assay, but a nearside test. Is this something that with the appropriate education and uh, potentially with those that inc increase in an awareness, because which is campaignable amongst patients, the combination of, the, of a pincer approach and outreach into the communities and an upgrade of awareness and education might actually give you the Give, give you that uh, more rapid diagnosis and tertiary care that you're looking for. Just yes, yeah. point of care diagnosis. I mean, if we had point of care tests such as Calprotectin, um, which would, would- Probably more would, impactful than, I mean, although uh, more impactful for a greater number than, than the delivery of a, a, a biologic uh, suite. Sure, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Definitely. I mean, that's a, Calprotectin would be such a fantastic tool to have mm -hmm. in the communities you know, at, at primary healthcare level, absolutely. Yes, and combination of that and, and an algorithm or, you know, a red flag, yeah. um, uh, you know, program to, to, to identifying patients with potential IBD. Yeah, I think that's probably what Catherine was saying, that if, if there was a document or some kind of algorithm or pathway that would narrow the patients who are more likely based on their symptoms and other exclusion of, say, infectious diarrhea, uh, that would be more likely to benefit from referral then to, to a tertiary center uh, might, you know, allow for earlier diagnosis sure. uh, and reduce that time uh, of diagnosis, particularly for Crohn's disease, which I think is really not readily recognized generally. Sure. Um, lots to think about. Um, thank you so much, David. Um, Joe, before we move on to the case, I was wondering if you have any comments or questions for David? Um, no, no, no real comments. Just uh, again, just to reiterate uh, what everybody said, it's a fantastic initiative and I think they were all incredibly proud of the work that you're doing. Um, so from me, most definitely a thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Uh, David, I'm looking forward to your case presentations. You always bring out the more complex, uh, difficult cases. So over to you. Thanks, Dish. Um... Okay, so the, the case I'm gonna present is really one that reflects the complexity of IBD care. Um, it also shows the impact of IBD on the life of a young patient and also the complications of the disease and its treatment. So this particular patient is a 29 year old woman from Kabecha, I hope I pronounced it right, formerly Port Elizabeth. Um, and she presented at the age of 18 with a short history of diarrhea and abdominal pain and weight loss. And she had a colonoscopy which showed a patchy colitis and she was given antibiotics. But she had ongoing symptoms and the following year she presented again with fever, erythema nodosum and a perianal fistula. And a scan, a CT scan showed ileal inflammation and the diagnosis was now confirmed as Crohn's disease. Um, this patient was first seen three years after diagnosis. And when she arrived to see me, she was on a low dose of prednisone, 
She was taking a small dose of azathioprine as well as silazepirine. Infliximab had been started five months previously at five milligrams per kilogram eight weekly during maintenance. But there was a history of infusion reactions and, and that is what prompted her referral. She had done reasonably well in terms of weight gain, so she certainly responded to the infliximab and her other treatments, but she still had symptoms um, of, of active inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease. So our investigations um, revealed that she had complex perianal fistulization with a residual abscess present, that she was anemic uh, with iron deficiency, and there was a 30 centimeter segment of active ileal disease that was sitting in the pelvis. So what did we do? We um, arranged for her to undergo an examination under anesthetic to have drainage of her uh, perianal sepsis and the insertion of um, seat and sutures. Um, we replaced her iron intravenously. Uh, we, we, uh, we stopped the silazepirine uh, and we, we um, so what about the infliximab? We decided in view of the history of infusion reactions and the to uh, um, uh, David, uh, just I'm, hold up for a second, please. Um, yeah, okay, I think they're muted now. Thank you. So what to do about the infliximab? Well, we were concerned about the incomplete response to treatment and the fact that she was having infusion reactions. And yes, when we did her trough level, it was undetectable and there was um, a significant antibodies present to infliximab. So one of the strategies to overcome this is to increase the um, immunomodulator, which we did. Um, we increased her azathioprine from 25 milligrams. We increased it up to 150. And we continued with five milligrams per kilogram, eight weekly of infliximab. And we gave her steroids prior to her infusions to deal with the infusion reactions. Um, she seemed to be doing okay, but there were still problems with infusion reactions and she was still symptomatic in terms of her Crohn's disease. So the next slide is just an interesting course over the next few years. So you can see in the beginning in 2011, her antibodies to infliximab were around five, trough level was very low. We increased her azathioprine to 150 milligrams uh, and kept her inf infliximab at five milligrams per kilogram eight weekly. And her antibody level dropped a little bit, but her trough level remained undetectable. We then increased her infliximab to 10 milligrams per kilogram eight weekly. And again, this is one of the strategies that one can employ to overcome um, antibodies. And we continued with azathioprine. And with that next maneuver, you can see that her, her infliximab trough level came up significantly and her anti -level, antibody level dropped. And we continued with combination therapy of azathioprine 150 milligrams, and we optimized her dose slightly by giving her 10 milligrams per kilogram seven weekly. Um, and we were able to maintain a satisfactory trough level and her symptoms actually improved and her infusion reactions resolved. So we were quite proud of ourselves that we had managed to overcome this without um, discontinuing her medication. Um, the surgeon, um, who some of you may recognize, was quite happy when he saw her again. He felt that the sepsis was completely quiescent now, um, and we were able to remove the seat and sutures, and he raised a concern about this indefinite um, combination of therapy, whether it was safe to do that. Just some thoughts on living with IBD. Um, this particular patient decided to study through correspondence, and at the same time, she was working in a family's convenience store. She was living with her parents. Socially, she was very isolated. She didn't have much of a social life. When we questioned her about this, she just said she's very embarrassed about her Crohn's disease, um, particularly the perianal fistulas. And she felt that you know, it wasn't possible to have a relationship um, because of this. She came down to Cape Town um, intermittently for infusions, and, and these really were the highlights of her visits, the highlights of her, her sort of life, and that these trips to Cape Town were really um, important uh, for her. If one looked at the impact of IBD on young people, you know, we just see so many signals here. Um, we can see um, that there's significant school absenteeism in young people with IBD, that there's emotional vulnerability, 
that IBD can affect academic performance, that there's a 25% depression rate and often uh, behavior problems in children. Um, so, you know, IBD has a broad impact on the life of a young person. And really we as doctors are obliged to sort of engage with our patients to find out about how we can best address these. So in 2014, she came for a routine surveillance endoscopy. Um, and when we got into the terminal ileum, which is the top right picture, um, there seemed to be good mucosal healing. In the rectum, there were these polyps that were noted and these when biopsy just showed granulation tissue and um, there were sort of uh, inflammatory polyps, but there was obviously no active proctitis, which um, was reassuring. So what do we do? She's now on azathioprine, 150 milligrams every day. We on a high dose of infliximab, we no longer need steroid pretreatment and endoscopically she's in remission. She then presented in 2015 with some skin problems, um, which were very disfiguring and further added to you know, issues of social isolation and embarrassment. And um, her dermatologist performed a biopsy. Um, we were worried about things like TB, um, but the diagnosis was acne. And this was reviewed at um, our multidisciplinary meeting. So we started her on doxycycline for the acne with a good clinical response, but this raised concerns about her combination immunosuppression. She'd been on it now for um, sort of five or six years. And, uh, you know, we were concerned that we were giving a high dose combination immunosuppression. So we decided to reduce her as a thyroid and see if we could maintain her adequate um, infliximab levels without having a, a relapse of her disease. So where are we? In 2015, sorry, let me move this. Uh, so in 2019, when I saw the patient last, she was now 29 years old, been living with Crohn's disease for 11 years. She had ileocolonic Crohn's disease with complex perianal disease. She documented extraintestinal manifestations. She was in a good remission but she'd been on high dose combination immune suppression for nearly 10 years. We had experienced significant treatment side effects, acne, infusion reactions, and we also recognized that IBD had a huge impact on her life. So where to from here? So we thought seeing we'd recently published some guidelines, we'd see if those guidelines could answer some of these questions. Um, often guidelines don't answer the very complicated issues, but anyway, we certainly, see that thiopurines can be used in combinations with biologics to reduce antibody formation, and that's what we had achieved. And that infliximab should be used in combination with thiopurine for induction and maintenance of remission in active Crohn's disease. Again, you know, no real guidance on exactly when to stop the treatment, but we know that they're both sort of acceptable as combo therapy. So in July, 2019, we felt that after 10 years of combination treatment, it would be wise to stop her as a thiopurine and see if she would maintain remission on monotherapy with infliximab and not experience um, a disease relapse. So she contacted me to say that she was concerned about her perianal disease, that it seems to be flaring up. Um, and there was some induration around the fistula openings, but no abscess or fistula. And we sent her a prescription for antibiotics and asked her to review with her local colorectal surgeon. And my thought at this stage was, okay, we've stopped the azathioprine, her, probably her infliximab trough levels have dropped and her disease is now making a resurgence. A resurgence. So the local colorectal surgeon found that there was a large granulating and fungating external opening um, at the 10 o'clock position, two centimeters from the anal verge. And he did what we would have expected from the surgeon, curated the collection, sent material away for histology he was concerned this may be TB, he wasn't sure. We were quite surprised when we found that the histology revealed an infiltrating, moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma of the fistulous tract. Um, this was a shock and, and, and to everyone involved. So all her immune suppression was stopped. That included her infliximab, and well, she was only on infliximab at that stage. An MRI showed quite extensive disease with inguinal nodes, her oncology team felt that a fertility sparing option was, was not possible due to the urgency in getting her into treatment. And she went on to combination chemotherapy and five weeks of radiation. 
So just a little bit about a malignant transformation of perianal fistulas in Crohn's disease. So anal neoplasia is rare, and there are risk factors that we are aware of in the general population, but immune suppression is certainly one of them. And in Crohn's disease, the malignant transformation can be either adenocarcinoma, where you have an adenomatous transformation of the fistulous tract, or squamous carcinoma, which is associated with HPV. This is a rare phenomenon and complication. When I last reviewed the literature, there were only 61 cases reported, and the majority of them were in women. And it was found that women had a shorter duration of disease when they developed this complication compared to males. In a small study of IVD patients, we found that HPV prevalence, in fact, was quite high. And it seemed to be associated with treatments with thiopurines. And certainly the HPV types seem to be of a higher risk group if one was on thiopurine. And if one performs uh, anal cytology, which not many of us do regularly, um, the, this can be identified in up to 42% of patients um, who, who have fistulas. So um, I was very surprised when the patient returned to see me this year um, recently. Um, she had completed her chemo radiation in a year ago. And surprisingly, she didn't require a stoma. We were all expecting that a stoma would be required due to the severity of um, perineal radiation. There'd been excellent healing of her perineum and she'd been on no Crohn's treatment for 12 months. And this is just um, an endoscopic view of her anus. And you can see that that looks remarkably normal for someone who's had a severe anal carcinoma or carcinoma of the fistulous tract. But when we got into the terminal ileum, there were signs that a Crohn's disease was starting to um, return. And we discussed the options and you know, our feeling was that a gut specific biologic was probably the safest route to go um, in terms of her um, ongoing management. So this case, I think, highlights the complexity of Crohn's disease management. And certainly, you know, people who are working in environments not as privileged as my own, um, you know, would have difficulty when it comes to this type of case that requires expensive medication and <clears throat> uh, multidisciplinary uh, therapy um, and multidisciplinary teams to, to help with decision making. I think one of the challenges this, this case highlights is if you diagnose disease in, at a young age, and these patients have a full life ahead of them. Um, the combination therapy with azathioprine and infliximab is um, you know, not without its issues. Um, I've just touched on the impact of IVD on social life, study, career, family. The cancer is a recognized and devastating consequence of IVD and, and its treatment. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we can always count on you to really bring out very difficult cases. Um, I mean, I did not expect the finding of the anal uh, squamous carcinoma in this patient, I must say. Um, and I think for me, the, the lesson is that you have a patient who you could argue relative to the average patient in South Africa and the average socioeconomic status of most patients in South Africa had very good access, um, you know, decent medical therapy, early, you know, treatment. Because if you consider that she presented with acute history of diarrhea, but already had had a colonoscopy and, and histology right. and so on. So it just makes you see, you know, the types of populations that we're dealing with, really privileged patients on the one spectrum and patients who would have probably never got diagnosed until it was really very late for them. And even so, you know, her outcomes were really worrying at some point. I mean, she, has, she seems to have done well now, but she's still young. And the outlook going forward, uh, I think, um, you know, one, one, one is not sure what will happen. What I'm wondering about is, you know, we always say um, that when you're about to start patients on immunosuppression, you should always, always review the vaccination history and make sure that patients get the vaccinations that they require. So my question is, would an HPV vaccine have helped? Um, or is that more for protection against cervical cancer? You know, that's, that's such a good question, Mesh. And I, I, I'm not even sure um, if, you know, if anyone has an answer. Where, should, should we, you know, I think HPV vaccination is now part of the South African vaccination schedule. I may be wrong, but I know a lot of um, 
in me, I don't think that David. And the message of message. getting vaccinated for HPV. Um, but I don't think it's part of the EPI. It's not part of the national. But it's certainly there's a big move now that, that you know young girls get vaccinated and as a cervical cancer um, prevention strategy. <clears throat> you know, whether that should be part of um, um, you know, IBD um, surveillance and screening and, and vaccination, I, I'm not sure. I mean, certainly we, we encourage our patients on immune suppression to have regular gynecological checks, checks to have pap smears, you know, looking for things like HPV and thing, you know, things like that or abnormalities related to HPV. But it's not something that I've ever considered in my patients and asking them, have you been vaccinated against HPV? Um, and uh, I would have to just you know, refresh my, 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 so the, my look at the literature to see whether, where, whether that's sort of appropriate or not. Um, whether that would have helped it anyway, I'm, I'm not sure. Right. Uh, Zinat says it is part of the National Child Vaccine Program. Oh, but I okay. think so it's a it is. fantastic case to say in young, <laughs> in fact, in young people, irrespective of whether they have IBD or not, and irrespective of whether you're treating with immunomodulators, uh, or biologics, they should all get HPV uh, vaccination, you know, anyway. And I think that's one of the things that we should do. But I think, again, it highlights, you know, the, the, we're very good at dealing with adult patients with IBD, but this, this group of adolescent, early adulthood, as you said earlier uh, in your presentation, they fall between the cracks and they, nobody's really looking after their specific needs um, and, and, and things like this happen. Um, are there any other questions or comments? I mean, I think this case is just fascinating on so many levels. Um, Catherine asks, what is your recommendation for the frequency of cervical screening for patients on azathioprine? Um, you know, I, I generally insist that patients have an annual gynae check. That, that's, you know, for patients on, on azathioprine, I say have an annual gynae check. That's my sort of advice. Um, not sure if, if that's correct or not, but uh, I try and do an annual dermatology check if they're on azathioprine, particularly that we're in a, a very, um, you know, it's in the Southern Hemisphere where we have you know, a lot of sun exposure. Um, mm -hmm. So I try and insist that patients see a, a dermatologist every, every year and a gynecologist every year. Um, I can't remember whether you said she was a smoker or not, uh, David. No, she wasn't a smoker. She'd been a, a lifelong non-smoker. Um, and now you're considering moving to gut-specific um, therapies. The question is, would that reliably and consistently treat her, her risk of her fistulizing disease? Yes. You know, it's, um, it's, 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 it's interesting. She, the words to me was, you know, the chemo and radiation um, seemed to have helped her Crohn's disease more than anything else. That was her words to me. She said it just melted away. You know, when she was on radiation and chemo, just everything got better, you know, she just felt so much better. Um, I, don't, I don't know how long the benefits of that are going to last. It's really difficult to know whether a gut specific biologic is, is going to hold her. I don't know. Um, these will all remain to be seen. I think the, the, the data for gut specific biologic for sort of severe complex fistulizing disease is, is probably very, very limited, if at all. Um, so I think it's really going to be a matter of, of of watching and waiting. I think the other options, there are very few options in someone who's had cancer. You know, what other options would we have in someone who's got sort of uh, complex fistulizing perianal disease? I think we'd be very limited in terms of what options we could offer her if her disease returns. Well, and she's at risk of radiation proctitis. Correct. There's that, there's the cancer recurrence, there's the Crohn's. I think it's just, we, we just we're in a very careful monitoring situation at present. Um, yeah. Um, any other questions? Uh, Chris, any comments? Yes, uh, in fact, I, I, if, you, if you don't mind, going back to Catherine Edwards' comments and, um, and David, um, one um, possibility that we've considered, and in fact wrote up a protocol with some Kenyan, Kenyan colleagues to address the uh, lack of endoscopic uh, availability in Sub-Saharan Africa, is perhaps to use capsule endoscopy as the screening test to select patients who might benefit from endoscopic diagnosis. So in other words, don't submit, subject everyone that you, you, you feel might 
uh, might require endoscopy, select those using fecal calprotectin and a capsule. Now you might say, well, capsule is very co costly, et cetera, but it requires very little expertise, can be read in the cloud. I mean, you can do a capsule in, uh, in Kenya and it can be re read in, in Vienna. And it, it might be just a way of, of lessening the burden on endoscopies and um, endoscopic expertise. It doesn't obviously obviate the uh, need for pathology, which still will be required, but um, that's just a thought. We, we're considering, we actually wrote up a protocol for patients with IBS-like symptoms to see which of those patients would require from endoscopy. So I think capsule endoscopy might be something very um, useful to look at in Sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> It's interesting you raise that uh, because this morning at our general club, we had that very robust discussion. Uh, Joel, I know you had uh, very specific thoughts about um, capsule endoscopy in patients uh, with Crohn's potentially and so forth. Um, would you care to comment uh, based on what Chris is saying? Yeah, but this is a completely different scenario what Chris is talking about. Uh, Chris is talking about somebody who's got IBS or IBS-like symptoms to try and um, uh, save the patient having an endoscopy, which is not available. What we're talking about today was the capsule endoscopy to follow up patients with Crohn's disease, um, something that I'm not particularly in favor of. Um, I really think that uh, cross-sectional imaging and endoscopy is, is the way to go for following up patients with Crohn's. And Dave, I'm not sure if you agree with me, Chris, Catherine. Oh, absolutely. And, and Jill, congratulations, because I think you're driving um, ultrasound uh, I mean, uh, in, in a big way. And I think that is the yes. way to go in patients with the established inflammatory bowel disease who need uh, surveillance. Uh, I think uh, ultrasound diagnosis is such a useful tool, non-invasive and gives you much more information. Yeah, so Mishika, this is a little bit different, but, um, but uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> thanks for your comments. Uh, no meeting is complete without involving my favorite colorectal surgeon, Adam. Are you still there? I'm just curious as to how often you see uh, squamous uh, carcinoma of the fistula tract in your experience. Maybe he, he was in the meeting, perhaps he's uh, logged off. All right. Well, um, I want to close. Um, so if there's anybody who's got any burning uh, comments or questions, uh, please let me know. Otherwise, uh, we will wrap up. Okay, in that case, thank you, David. Really appreciate uh, your presentations. I think they were informative, uh, stimulating. And I think the case that you presented really has got so many lessons, so many things that uh, I think everybody on the call or, you know, would benefit from. And just think about some of these issues uh, in the management of their patients. So it uh, leaves me then just to thank everybody, uh, all the participants. We really appreciate your interest uh, and you joining us um, every week. Next week, we're having HCC, very important topic in Sub-Saharan Africa. We had the first very successful meeting uh, about four weeks ago. I'd like to thank uh, Project ECHO, New Mexico, as well as the India team for their assistance. And of course, Cheryl and uh, Karen, please uh, look out uh, in the uh, chat for the feedback. We always uh, could use your, your comments. Uh, and I wish you all a pleasant afternoon. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Mish. Yes.